in the march in pairs in the UK. Um, I guess we can do a bit of a call out to that um, at the end. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm Arin Kerucho. I'm an internationalist uh, who is part of the Kurdish Freedom Movement, um, who spent some time in Russia. Um, just uh, to quickly go through uh, tonight, um, we're using Zoom for the event, obviously, you're all here, you see this. Um, everybody is currently muted. If you're not muted, please keep yourself muted, um, unless uh, you want to ask a question. There'll be some time for questions at the end. Um, we'll probably have about half an hour or so, um, so uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself there. Um, there is a chat function on Zoom that is uh, available for you to use. Uh, please be respectful and nice to each other and to the speakers when you're using the chat function. Uh, you can put questions in the chat, but uh, just bear in mind that we may not see them and it might be better um, to shout them out if you feel comfortable doing that. Uh, the event tonight is going to be recorded um, and put off up on the KSM WordPress when we have the opportunity to do so um, again. So, um, Without further ado, I guess I'll ask the people who are speaking to introduce themselves. Uh, Raima, do you want to go first? Ah, if you like. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the preparation of this uh, meeting or webinar. Um, yeah, I'm Raima. I have been working with the International Initiative, Freedom for Abdullah Peace in Kurdistan for a long time now, more than 15 years. And I'm one of the translators of Erdogan's texts into German. Um, but I'm also helping, you know, overseeing the other translations and doing all kinds of solidarity work with the Kurdish movement, but especially with Abdullah Jalan and have a struggle for his freedom. I'm joining from Germany. Thank you. Um, and Claire, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you very much and hello everybody. Uh, thank you for the invite today. Uh, my name is Claire Baker. I'm an uh, international officer for Unite the Union and I sit on the uh, uh, UK's Freedom for Erdogan Trade Union um, campaign. Um, I work in the union all, on the campaign but also on a lot of other solidarity campaigns like uh, Palestine and Colombia and I also do a, a lot of uh, industrial work with members across the public sector construction um, and uh, food, drink and agriculture sectors across Europe and globally. Thanks. Thank you. And Baraband, if you'd like to go. Oh, you're still muted. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Baraband Karachov. I'm also an internationalist who was involved with the Kurdish Freedom Movement for a couple of years. I spent some time in Rojava um, and I work uh, with the Kurdish Freedom Movement and Kurdish Women's Movement, particularly also with genealogy uh, and back in the UK. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you. Thank you. Baravan, your sound's a little bit sketchy, um, so just maybe while the others are speaking, but um, you can do some adjustments. Um, so, um, I guess the agenda for tonight is uh, I will. Um, just uh, ask a few questions to each of the speakers um, and then open the floor for questions from people who are um, who are participating in the event because we also want to hear from you guys and we want this to be like an opportunity for people to get to know Ojalan and his works a little bit better um, as I know for some people it's like uh, him as a figure it's um, like new or like something that is not quite well understood by people in the UK yet. So, um, Roma, would you like to go first with the questions? Yes, don't you? Now you're muted. <laughs> right, okay, yes, I can go first. There we go. You have, you have questions or? Okay, uh, yeah, I have some questions for you. So the first is, uh, how did you meet the Kurdish freedom movement um, and what was your perspective when you first heard about Ojalan and how has that changed over the time that you've been involved with the movement? Well, I've, I've met the, the, the movement kind of in, in the early 90s and mostly via the repression against the Kurds, like uh, 
that when the war in the 90s was really as at, at its highest point in 93 94 that's when i heard heard about it i, I got to know kurds and uh, i went to kurdistan on a delegation for the first time um so at the time it was really a lot for me about the you know the repression or the things that were happening to the you know kurdish parties in in uh, in, in turkey and all these things and i didn't know very much about erdogan at the time it was just like you know the pkk there were people erdogan was one of them and i you know had had heard the name but uh, i didn't really know very much about him that only came later when i realized that you know there were texts translated by him you know speeches by him were translated and published and got more interested uh in what what he was actually saying and uh well, I only later got to understand like how tremendously important he was for everything that happened actually in, in Kurdistan there. Great. Um and as one of the translators of the defense writings or the person writing um what parts of the ideology do you feel have most touched you or like have come close to you and can you explain them a little bit yeah well well first of all uh i find it important that uh that's actually a lot of different things that uh Adrian's writing on so he has a lot to say on uh, on a lot of topics which uh, gives gives actually a lot to think uh you know about you know the, in terms of organization in terms of history in terms of you know what what socialism is what it what it means uh for the people on you know everything concerned connect with the kurdish question on the relationship between the middle east and europe so so that's there's really a lot of of topics and if you look into the the books actually there's even more like it's on religion it's on on all kinds of things um what for me was like the most striking in the beginning and still is is like how completely different you can tell the the history of the world on and the history of Europe and everything from from a totally different perspective you know like how he offers always new perspectives on on things that you know I thought I knew uh but then come to come to think about it actually I I don't know much at all and you can can read everything very very differently so this is on you know on on gender relation on uh, the history of the patriarchy the history of civilization in general everything that concerns Europe like looked at it from from another perspective from a freedom movement in the middle east you you get to a very different perspectives and that's what i found most surprising and and most interesting uh about his writing for me for myself great and we were talking a little bit about like before we were talking a little bit about like uh things that people were asking you to translate beforehand as well and you were talking about this <laughs> this uh, piece of work that he did on love. And I think this is really something that is like um, interesting about Ojalan is he's, he's writing about Isn't everything. It? He's like writing about, you know, the whole of what socialism should look like and, and what like free, free life should look like. Um, are there any topics that like, particularly when you were doing the translation felt like they were like sticking out or like something that you, you kept coming back to or, were really interested to understand uh, i don't know i mean there's there's really a lot of of topics where he actually brought me to research them further like you know when i was reading about the you know the beginnings of the of the civilized uh, societies about the first states like I, I was then reading more about the sumerians and when he's writing or when i was translating about you know history of patriarchy i was then reading you know feminist literature and when he writes about the history of the religions you know i go more into the research of the you know christianity and and islam and everything so it's uh it, it was basically for me you know after I, I you know got to do these things i got to read these things all after i finished university so i felt it was like going through these books was like a complete new uh study like a complete new you know, university to go into all these topics really yeah it's really it's amazing when you start reading him like how much history you have not been taught in school or how many things like just yeah and, are and, not there and, and to connect the dots you know i found history terribly boring in school because it was you know like learning dates or events that didn't really interest me and and with urgelan i got an understanding like how history works how things are connected over you know the short term but also over the long term 
what it all, all means and you know how how people make history and what what struggles are uh, are in there and this is all it's uh, what, what i found also surprising is like how especially in the later books you know, how, how little it is on you know the kurds you know it's all about you know world history it's about socialism it's about all aspects of life uh, you know how they can be liberated and of course he makes the connections with you know kurdish history and kurdish society but it's only part of the and and surprisingly little part of all his writing i think that's something really important with him like he's a he's a really internationalist writer like he's not writing just on the kurdish question he's writing for the whole of the middle east he's writing for the whole world and like he doesn't just write on well on like a short small like geographical revolutionary or he doesn't write for a small geographical uh, revolutionary purpose like a national liberation purpose yeah. of course this is like on the agenda for him but he writes like for the revolution for the world right yeah we always have this problem with with publishers and and bookstores like how, where to sort him and then they sort him like you know turkey or you know middle east but i you know we go now no this is like you know this is socialism this is like you know world history this is theory this is uh, philosophy you know, it's not Middle East, you know, what, uh, it's not like a book on Iraq or something like that when, when he writes something. So we feel he's, he's, he's misplaced almost everywhere. There was a, a bookstore owner who said he, he didn't know where to place it because he placed it at history, then he placed it at philosophy, then he took the book out again and placed it elsewhere. And uh, yeah, we really feel it's much, much too narrow view to put him into like, yeah, he's writing on the Kurds, or he's writing on the Middle East. It's not really what he's doing, he's really writing a, a philosophy of history, actually. Hmm. But he's important things. to the Middle East, right? And like we said, we would talk a little bit also about this topic of the Middle East and like why Ojalan is so um, so key to the Middle East as a figure, uh, particularly in the situation at the moment. Of course, we have like all of the imperial powers, like particularly in Syria. Uh, we've got Russia and America all in there and, and like China now taking a little look. Um, so why why do you find him so important for the Middle East in general, not just for... Well, I, I think he's important because he's not only, you know, writing and, you know, writing theory and creating theories and, and ideas, but because he was such an amazing uh, organ, or he is, uh, I mean, what he has done is organizing people. He's, he's been very good at organizing people and creating a movement that is really so resilient that all the all the things that happened, you know, in 1990, the, the abduction and all kinds of attacks by all kinds of state, you know, they have been resilient enough to, to stay on their feet and continue and deepen the revolution, you know, make it an ever more feminist revolution and, you know, develop all kinds of aspects instead of, you know, shrinking back and, you know, getting smaller and narrowing the, the issues down. Uh, you know, if you look at Kurdish history, there has been a lot of uprising, but they were terribly short-lived and then crushed. Like also in other parts of the world, we're seeing a lot of protests today in a lot of countries, but they're short-lived and get crushed easily by the state. And, and Erdogan has managed to create something that is uh, not being crushed, but is growing and, and spreading. Uh, and that may really change the, the face of, of, it has already changed the face of Kurdistan. It is changing the face of the Middle East right now, and it may change the face of the world. I completely agree. Um, I guess, yeah, this is a good time to also ask this other question that we had prepared, which is that you were around at the time, like you, you were with the movement at the time when Ojalan was first captured in the international conspiracy. And I think it's important we talk a bit about the 15th of February and what this means. Um, so maybe you can introduce a bit the inter international conspiracy and why it felt so important for all of these nation states to work together to capture Abdullah Ojlan. And then I'll ask you the question that we've got following on from that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember 99, of course, everybody who's lived through it remembers 99, I guess, because it was, uh, uh, was a terrible ups and downs uh, in, in that year. There was, Erdogan had come to Europe in late 98, and there were hopes for, you know, a political solution or at least political talks or bringing the the issue on an on the agenda of Europe and trying to get some maybe some you know dialogue or process with Turkey going uh, which was then terribly disappointed because all the states uh, worked against that nobody wanted to have him nobody wanted to even talk to him 
uh, like Germany didn't even want to prosecute him. They had an, a warrant against him, and he said, "Okay, I can come to Germany. You try me in court, and I will, you know, I will talk like this kind of a super indirect dialogue." From and then they uh, lifted the warrant. They didn't want him anymore. Mm. So um, nobody, they, you know, they all wanted to get rid of him. America made a lot of pressure. That was the position of Germany. The Netherlands didn't want to have. They, they closed the airports. You know, all the NATO countries closed everything. Uh, and and worked together in the end to deliver him to Turkey. It wasn't Turkey that uh, apprehended him, but uh, he was delivered to Turkey. And then what happened was nobody had expected that. I mean, there was a all over the world there were Kurdish protests sustained. Sometimes very very people were very outraged. There was a huge wave of solidarity in all parts of Kurdistan. Like you know, nobody had expected. I think the movement hadn't expected that. The states had certainly hadn't expected that. And and people felt you know terribly betrayed. They thought at first thought you know everything was over. It it was a terrible time, and then it was also very exciting when you know all this um, this uh, when the actual this mock trial when it started. Erdogan was able to address the public. He came up with ideas. He came up with suggestions. He tried to bring things forward that wasn't very well understood at the beginning. What he was trying to do. You know, there were all kinds of, uh, you know, talks about what, what's he trying to do. And uh, then when subsequently all his, you know, his writings came out and when he, he tried to systematize all, all these ideas, um, people got to understand it better. But by then, I must say, I mean, before 99, I was very active in the solidarity movement in, in Germany. Uh, a lot of that broke down. That was really when when Kurdish movement had would have needed it most in 1999. It, it almost broke down in Germany, and only very slowly built up again when it became really clear what the movement was doing and where it was going. That it became ever more you know democratic, ever more feminist, uh, and and uh, discussed all these new ideas. On, well, they weren't entirely new, but you know Erdogan tried to really systematize them and push them and and bring them onto the agenda. And uh, when that was also seen more in practice, first in North Kurdistan and then a lot in Rojava, people got, again, more and more interested in what was happening. And I guess you were telling me a bit about, like, how it was when he was first captured and how it kind of brought people together as well. Like Yes, it did. I mean, there were, like, in the, I was in a relatively small town in Germany and there were very few Kurds, actually, and from, from all parts of Kurdistan. Uh, they weren't doing much together at the time, and uh, when you know when the the, the protests then happened against uh, you know what had happened suddenly all the, the Kurds from southern Kurdistan the you know the uh, people who normally would be like pro P KDP or pro PUK or so they they were all marching together no matter what you know their respective parties or said that that brought all the Kurds together there were huge. Uh, demonstrations in the east in the Iranian 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 occupied part of Kurdistan in Urmi there was a huge demonstration I think it was a hundred thousand people or something everybody was surprised nobody you know knew that uh, the PKK had such a mass support in Urmi in, in, in Iran so this uh, changed a lot also about the perception of the of the Kurds worldwide that you know the the Solidarity with Erdogan had had such a massive force that made the Kurds so visible all over the world. That was very impressive. And lastly, before I come to you, Claire, I just wanted to ask you, Roma, a bit about the the defense writings or the prison writings, and like whether you could introduce them a bit because obviously they're going to come up quite a bit tonight because this is like a big piece of work that Oshman did and, mm -hmm. and something that you know, like lots of people sort of had have heard alluded to but maybe not they don't know what the books are or like how how they've come out or how they've come to be translated or how they managed to get to you even because that's got to be a story right yeah it's quite a story we, we in, i think in some of them we have put it into the foreword or just described it um what what these writings uh technically are is that they are submissions to court so they're either submission to a court in Turkey or in Athens or to the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg, France, um, because that is basically the only way for Erdogan to communicate anything. Like he couldn't write an article and send it to a newspaper. He's like in total isolation ever since 99. 
uh, has very sparely contact only with uh, lawyers and in recent years even that almost not at all happened like he was in practically complete isolation for eight nine years now uh, so these submissions to the court were his only chance to get something written out and and actually they are so um, they were they're, they're written as submissions and then they're taken to the files of the the case whatever it is at the time um, and then from there one can you know photocopy them and and publish them so that's how they te technically come into existence but uh, uh, the, the content is uh, Ajalan's trying to systematize his ideas on a lot of topics and he is uh, he has been developing his style over the years he has um, he has written thousands of pages on on all these topics that we mentioned so it's basically he's attempting to contribute his immense uh, knowledge and experience as you know as a leader as an organizer as a revolutionary who is building on the works of other revolutionaries trying to make this available for everybody so like he's trying to you know create something that serves other people in their struggle for their freedom uh, be that in the middle east or in europe like in a capitalist metropolitan area as well as in the you know, Kurdish uh, or, you know, North Syrian countryside. And Claire, I think that segues nicely into your, like, area, because you're doing the Freedom for Ojalan campaign, well, the Time Is Now campaign, which has just launched. So maybe, like, you can connect a bit with what Raima was, say was just saying about, like, the conditions of Ojalan and, and why this campaign has been launched in the UK. I've got other questions for you, like, the ones that we've, we have talked about, but like i think this is like a good moment to talk about it maybe this has come up like quite um, yeah sure so the uh so the freedom fergiland campaign in the uk uh started in 2016 um following the uh well from where unions had seen what had happened in kabani basically um and uh we started with two unions um, and has grown to 15 affiliated trade unions in the uk supported by the tuc um, and Thompson Solicitors, which is the trade union uh, lawyer's firm. Um, and yeah, Erdogan's condition, conditions in prison are, are a key key element of that campaign. Obviously, we're, we're campaigning not just for his freedom, but in the end of his isolation. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we run alongside all of the campaigns and stuff that uh, the Kurds are doing as well. And I guess, yeah, to you Claire like how did you first meet the movement how did you get involved like what made, what drew you to Ojalan as a character um so for me personally uh I came more consciously aware of Ojalan and of the situation facing the Kurds as I said around the time of Kobani um I had known uh you know about the Kurdish people's struggles and the horrors that they had faced especially you know in Iraq where we'd seen all that stuff on on the the news, etc. Um, but it was Kobani that uh, became the point where I moved from a sympathetic bystander um, to someone who uh, wished to be more actively involved. And I can remember helping to write the Unite Union uh, statement, um, which was on the appalling situation where Turkey was refusing to let um, Kurds cross the border in order to help um, the people of Kobani. And I can just remember being shocked about how this country where so many people as, you know, a lay person in the UK, where so many of my friends and colleagues would go on holiday to Turkey, um, that a country like that could behave in such a way. Um, and of course, it opened my eyes to the YPJ and uh, the role of women and uh, Erdogan's writings on women uh, liberation is probably the most important and inspiring thing for me of what Erdogan does. And recognising that for 5,000 years uh, that women have been oppressed um, to the detriment of all, men included, um, is that how we see that the liberation of women means that it's the liberation of society. Um, and that his writings inspired the YPJ and the efforts that they were making in Kobani. Um, and it was all just a light bulb moment for me. Um, this was something more and something different to any other women's movement 
or solidarity movement that I'd ever come across. Um, on a simple level, it was astounding that this part of the world where we see women's rights systematically trampled on, um, that the women of Rojava, based on Erdogan's writings, um, have been so instrumental in putting democratic principles into practice. Now, I know that's not been like a magic wand um, in many years of hard work. Um, oh. The fact that in such a patriarchal society, uh, women have organised and um, put and kept inclusivity, equality and women's rights front and centre of all that they do there is beyond admirable. Um, and we see far too often here in the UK and within the trade union movement um, that women's structures can be seen um, as a, like a nice add-on um, once all other structures are in place, so like a bit of a pat on the head once all that, all the that stuff has been done. And so it, is, it was inspirational and refreshing to see this society front and centre being all about women. So I had that inspiration and I admired them and I began working on the uh, Trade Union Freedom for Urgeland campaign um, and I met some amazing activists um, a couple of which are on here, like Elif and Estella and Ibrahim Dugas, um, whose dedication to it just really inspired me. You know, their, they, their enthusiasm keeps your enthusiasm going for it. And then I was uh, lucky to see uh, Roger for first hand and it, it wasn't a disappointment. Um, you think that Roger Ver, when you're doing the work, uh, some sort of mythical place sometimes. Um, and I know, you know, some of you have actually been there. Um, but when you when you're there and you see it in action, it, it truly is a wonderful, and it's it's all right. Everything that you've been preaching about is all there. Um, so that you know is, is all part of my inspiration of keeping going but also on top of that is now the uh, systematic targeting of Rojava um, and Erdogan by the Turkish state um, the invasion the occupation the ethnic cleansing of Afrin with the help of former Daesh fighters and the uh, continuing attacks and further further into Rojava um, all in the name of this this pretense of protecting Turkey's borders uh, reminds you that actually Turkey is afraid of what Rojava stands for. They, you know, the women's liberation, the freedom of religion, the equality for all, uh, be it Kurdish, Yazidi, Assyrian, Ab um, Arab, Christian, etc. This is the opposite of what Erdogan is doing in his country, where people are oppressed and women's rights are disappearing. And even the talk of peace is becoming a taboo there. Um, but I have personally been very appalled at the specific targeting of women by Turkey, the, the murders and the kidnappings, and then the subsequent filming and posting on social media by these jihadi fighters uh, shows a, such a deep level of inhumanity that I, I just can't let that go. And I have to keep fighting for this. So on a personal level, I think that Rojava and Erdogan is on the front line in this global struggle for women's liberation. And uh, one of which is society that I think we should all protect. And as a mum of two girls, um, I see them as very lucky, um, extremely lucky to be born in the UK. Um, on the whole, they've got freedom, choice, protection. Um, and these are things that the Kurdish women are fighting for, but not just for that, they're fighting for something more than that. Um, and that we see in Erdogan's writings and the actions of the women in, in the local government system in Rojava, right through grassroots, all the way through um, the YPJ and also the global uh, Kurdish women's movement, um, such as, you know, the 100 Reasons campaign and stuff. Um, I have, I've just found unbelievably inspirational and it, it's it's one of the best campaigns that I have ever been involved in and I always say to my children that you know you need to look at the Kurdish women if you want a role model you look to the Kurdish women which which is basically what I do. That's so nice that's really um yeah nice and personal I think the 100 reasons campaign I don't know Varavan are you are you there um because you might be a good person to just 
like say a few words on this also? Oh, I see you posted the link. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like, do you want to introduce the campaign? Is that a bit? Coming I know. Through okay, do you want me yeah. to say a bit? Yep. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, so, yeah. So the 100 Reasons campaign um, that Claire uh, just touched on, just mentioned, um, sorry everyone, I'm going to turn off my video just for this bit because I think my internet's a bit unstable. Uh, the 100 Reasons campaign that Claire just touched on is um, has been started by the Kurdish women's movement in Europe. So this is this kind of international initiative. I put a link to the website which has got a petition on it in the chat. Um, and it's a hundred reasons to prosecute Erdogan um, as a dictator, um, specifically focusing on the crimes against women, violence against women and femicide that's committed by the fascist uh, Turkish state. Uh, and the campaign at the moment started on the 25th of November, the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And it, this phase of the campaign will run until the 8th of March. So we have exactly one more month. I want to gather at least, you know, 100,000 signatures for the symbolic 100 number. Um, and this is the sort of first phase of the campaign of gathering support, raising awareness and gathering these signatures. And after that, um, the campaign will continue um, taking action, raising awareness further and attempting to like um, move towards um, as unsymbolic as possible or symbolic if it needs to be like legal steps along these lines um so this is something where you can concretely support it is signing a petition but it's part of something much bigger than that it's part of a broad strategy and so it's really adding our voices to the Kurdish women's movement speaking out for itself so yeah uh, links in the chat and it's a really great campaign thanks claire bring it up thanks on um and claire i'll just come back to you a bit because um, I wanted to also talk a bit about trade unions in the UK and like, you know, also we're in this point in the UK where I think sometimes it can, at the moment, like, what, you know, one of the places where I find a lot of hope is in, in the Kurdish freedom movement. And I felt like before I, I left for Rojava, like, I was really struggling with continuing to be involved in political struggle because the UK, like, can some, sometimes like our left can really lack hope and yeah. I wonder like how that links with for you like with the trade union work because obviously like our trade unions are also super repressed by the state and like how how the movement kind of links with that and how how we can build up trade unions how you see those two things working together well I think hope is the uh, is the key word there I mean the Kurdish political movement brings the trade union movement hope, you know. Um, Erdogan is important to the trade union movement uh, because of his political texts um, that he managed has managed to produce and Reimar and colleagues have faithfully, uh, you know, translated. Um, and the, I, th the, I think that the movement, the trade union movement recognises that the exceptional historical political um, insight that that those texts provide, um, and as well as the potential solutions that they offer to all of our our problems that we face, it, you know, in society across the globe. Um, but also, you know, where what the solutions to conflict and bloodshed in you know the Middle East itself. Um, but what's important that stands at the middle of his writings is the principles of peace, democracy, equality, inclusivity, tolerance, are the very principles that the trade union movement has been uh, founded on. Um, and it's what we've always built and participated in with our other solidarity campaigns, as I mentioned before, with the Palestine and Colombia, Cuba, Western Sahara, South Africa, many, many more that the trade union movement has been uh, a key uh, movement in those campaigns. Um, so we've got that long, long history of supporting social justice movements, um, but also, you know, supporting trade unionists themselves who are facing uh, extreme repression, intimidation, violence, um, imprisonment and death. Um, so, you know, we have a link there with um, uh, many of the uh, 
Turkish trade unions, the independent ones, I mean, like DISC and KESK. Um, so the situation that faces those trade unions um, is, and the situation that faces the Kurds in Turkey are intrinsically linked. Um, Erdogan is attacking all progressive forces in that country. Um, the war on the Kurds has extended to a war on all who oppose him and all who stand up for human and worker rights um, in that country. And we cannot campaign for human rights of the Kurds without too campaigning for the rights of trade unions and free civil society in Turkey and vice versa. Um, so trade unions understand uh, that Erdogan shares the values and visions that we that we hold dear to us um, as trade unionists and we saw how they they have been put into practice in Rojava um, and what has been achieved in Rojava is vital to the trade union movement um, you know the, the grassroots democracy the you know as I've said the women's self-liberation etc um, is perhaps probably one of the first truly democratic truly democratic societies in existence defying war you know terrorism etc um and it's important to the trade unions uh to see what the kurdish people have done um is what many people claimed could not have been done in the middle east um they've overcome patriarchy ethnic religious divides etc um, and they've proved that you can have uh, a society without, you know, a strong man or, um, you know, the kind of democracy imposed by, you know, the bombing of by the West, for example. Um, you know, I, we say a lot all the time, you know, in the Freedom for Urgeland campaign, Rogerville is this beacon of light, um, not just for the Middle East, but for the world. Um, and I feel that I say it so much, but it is, it's really important, it's really key, but it's also important for the trade union movement to learn that too. Um, how it's redefined uh, society, he's redefined society in Rogerford from a patriarchal culture to one of equality, something that the trade unions themselves can learn from. Um, and I think it's really simple for us as a movement. Um, if our beliefs and our principles mean anything to us, uh, we've got to defend those in the one place where they're living and breathing reality, you know? And um, we must campaign to, to protect Rojava, to protect the people of Rojava and to free Erdogan. Um, and I think in these very troubled times, Erdogan's writings can give people uh, across our movement a real hope for a better future. Um, the task is difficult to get the message out there to people. It's it's you know it's not it's not through our movement yet. Um, it's it's been it's been taken up by you know our main federation, the TUC. We've had lots of uh, big big actions. We've been to the big working class festivals and stuff. So the message is getting out there. Um, but once people learn about it. Um, you know, lay people from across the UK, as soon as they learn about it, they, they truly love it in the way that I do, the way that you guys do. Um, so, you know, we've got a job of work ahead of us. We will get, we will get state repression. I mean, we, we put a, um, an event on at City Hall uh, a couple of years ago, and, you know, we're at the London Mayor's offices. And uh, the Turkish embassy put immense amounts of pressure on the London mayor to shut that down, immense amount of pressure on the general secretaries of the union to shut it down, and everybody refused to do it. Um, but that's, you know, that's the, the battle that we constantly have to face. Um, but we're prepared to face it, you know, we've, uh, there's a commitment across all the major unions of the UK to do this. So, yeah, we will face repression, but we'll, we'll, we'll be fighting back against that. Super inspiring, thank you. Um, so Baraban, uh, just over to you. I can't see you on my screen, so I'm just gonna, just gonna find you. Um, so you are an internationalist who has spent the last two years in the Kurdish women's movement um, in Rojava. Uh, I just, I guess maybe, do you wanna introduce like that time, how that time came about, how you were, how you felt about the movement beforehand, how you met the movement a little bit? Thanks, Ari. Um, 
so yeah just jump in if the quality gets bad i'll switch off my video again it's nice to kind of talk to you all normally but if it's at the expense of being understood then i'll just switch off again so let me know um so yeah i think similar uh kind of story to claire claire mentioned feeling like a sympathetic bystander up to a certain point and similarly i was for a long time like aware of the Kurdish struggle maybe in quite a superficial way but very aware that you know I was I was on side with that uh aware of the Kurdish women's movement very admiring that aware of the YPG for example as this kind of high profile um area or part of the Kurdish women's movement um and I think I just never really realized just how internationalist the movement actually is like in itself it's not that this is some Thing that's going on in Kurdistan and we and the rest of the world have like stepped up and reached out and made it international at all like the movement um is not only international but internationalist in its values you know it doesn't say you know it not only doesn't make sense but it's not what we desire that a revolution happens in one small corner of the world you know this is this has to be for everyone um and so I I found that out um, I found that out when, uh, and, and the sort of depth of that, when an old friend of mine traveled to uh, Syria, um, North and East Syria to fight with the YPG and as such became part of the, or much, um, much more so, much more deeply involved in the Kurdish women's movement. Uh, and that was Anna Campbell, uh, who many of you also know, um, and many of you will have heard of. Uh, she um, was killed by a Turkish airstrike in the invasion of Afrin. Um, and before uh, we we lost Anna, um, I was already from in like conversation with her, realizing the kind of breadth and scope and an invitation of this movement, and starting to get some idea of the kind of of open arms which the Kurdish women's movement offers uh, internationalist women revolutionaries from across the world. Um, and I was starting to think that my path also lay that way. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I suppose that the decision wasn't made by losing Anna, but that certainly was uh, sealed the deal in a way for me uh, and made me um, really convinced I had to see it myself and had to um, find her in a different way by following those footsteps and moving in the same spaces. And so then I went to Rojava for six months and two years later, I eventually came back um which is not a totally uncommon story um because that is uh, still not enough time two years is still not enough time to really understand and be part of the movement um I mean a whole lifetime isn't enough but once you uh, become connected in that way and you uh really feel you know I think solidarity is a very important concept but looking at solidarity in the way of like i'm over here and i'm in solidarity with you over there and that's separate it, it does have a flaw and it can only take us so far and um what you experience as part of the kurdish women's movement is not that at all you experience like this is our revolution this is our fight oh great you're here we're all in this fight together let's do this um and there isn't this sense of division It's still very important that we all know our context and know our specifics but and i think this all of this perspective um comes to a huge huge extent from like ojalan's ideology and from the impact that he's had the impact that he's had and his ideology has had on the whole kind of freedom movement um and also on the space that he always gave and carved out and kind of pushed for the women's movement to take for itself um like it is you know let's uh let's be honest it's a really strange thing for like women internationalists to come and join this women's movement and there's this man who is like really important figure and we all kind of go eh and it's uh it's a thing that takes time to process and is challenging uh and i think that's really healthy to be challenged and to like learn to understand what this is really about and dig deep enough with like respect and love and come to understand it um, and one of the first moments that I had I was chatting to someone with more experience in the movement than me and they were kind of telling the story of how Ujlan was with the women's movement in the 1990s and talking about like he was always pushing in the back you know it's not about like taking the space at the front it's about pushing in the back and saying you know there's 
so many so many examples of him saying you have to go and do this you guys have to go and create this space like um being this kind of driving force without um dominating this different type of of leadership so i think that's also really inspiring as well thank you for that yeah i think um a lot of things that you said i want to ask you questions about because i think that there's loads of interesting stuff in that and also you know because we're friends this is a very easy thing to do um but uh i guess the thing that that i guess people would want to hear is like you at the moment you do a lot of translation for the women's movement and you're like you know doing a lot of the ideological work uh, I think we should big up the Kushtina Zalam brochure, uh, the Killing the Dominant Male brochure that just came out and has been edited. So I'd like to give you a bit of space to do that. But also to just talk a bit about this ideology that you're you're translating in a genealogy, con genealogy uh, context and to explain a bit what genealogy is as well, because mm -hmm. I'm sure people are interested in this. And how Ojlan is connected to that as well. Yeah. So genealogy, um, Jin is the Kurdish word, the Comanche Kurdish word for woman, and ology is then taken from the, is it Greek or Latin, but like biology, physiology, science of. So genealogy is the science of women. Um, and genealogy was kind of proposed by Ujlan in one of the defense writings that Raimar was just speaking about, um, the I'm third. On a webinar now, the, Kurdish webinar. the third of them. Um, sorry. <laughs> Someone's mic's on. Um, in the third of the the third defense writing. Um, Sorry, Barry, I've just muted everyone, and and now maybe you can unmute. Great. Um, and um, uh, so Odilon proposed that genealogy as this science of women and life. It's crucial in the Kurdish language. Uh, woman and life, Jin and Jian, they have this common root anyway, so it's kind of implicit in what you say, uh, but it's also a political principle for the freedom, Kurdish freedom movement that you always bring back this connection between women and life. As Claire said, you know, women's liberation means the liberation of everyone. Um, and so he proposed this idea of genealogy in one of the writings, and this has all happened since he's been in total isolation, and is, as Roman described, like, contact the world is really briefly through the odd lawyers meeting and through this like amazing defense writings project um and so he made this proposal just in like a line of text in a paragraph in one of these books and the kurdish women's movement kind of picked it up and has just run with it and done the most amazing stuff with it so genealogy aims to be both uh an intervention into science and knowledge in general that says we need to center the social sciences and we need to center society and to do that well we need to center women and women's experiences and women's histories and like anti-patriarchal histories and this, the the idea of this uh, hidden history that's not the history of oppression um so it's a kind of intervention into science and knowledge in general it sounds really broad and nebulous and it is really broad and ambitious it's literally talking about like what is knowledge what is truth and how do we understand those how do they uphold power and how can we intervene in that um, and at the same time it's making intervention in social science saying yeah we need to center social science in all other sort of forms of knowledge but the social science we have right now has historically been used as a tool for oppression so we need to change the way that we do that as well and for me, the way that I understand genealogy is asking us to look again at all kind of science and knowledge and all this stuff. And instead of just asking, like, what is this? What can we know? What can we possibly do? We're asking, like, why are we doing this? Who is this for? Who does it benefit? And if every single step in science, in academia and so on, had to ask these questions, how does this affect the situation of women as, as a group, as a class, not individuals. How does this affect society? Who is this for? Why are we doing it? I think the world would be a really different place. And I think you can think about how history could have gone very differently. Uh, genealogy is now, there's um, work of genealogy in all different like areas, all four parts of Kurdistan, um, all uh, has kind of of different relationships to different political groups it's not a political movement it's a science um, and it's a production of knowledge and it's something people can participate in also in latin america and also in europe um there's genealogy committees um, working on kind of all sorts of different things um uh, can you type the the website into the chat please Arlene? um 
so we have a website in several different languages. Um, it's just genealogy.org and there's a, an English option. Um, and yeah, um, what's quite exciting is we're now in English able to subtitle a lot of the products of the Genealogy Academy, which are on the website or on YouTube. Um, and we've produced a few kind of pamphlets, booklets. The most recent one that Arine was mentioning um, is the book about the theory of killing the dominant male. And this is coming back to, in a lot of ways, uh, Ojalan's ideology. Um, it's not literal, nobody panic. Um, killing the dominant male is essentially um, not unlike the way that other parts of the world might talk about critical masculinity. Um, it's spoken about, Ojalan has this theory of, of killing the man, and it means to kill the dominant patriarchal oppressive force, like created as masculinity and to kill that within us all, particularly, um, particularly men and particularly people who, um, yeah, who are, live within masculinity. So like, yes, there is a dominant male within everyone, but it's particularly the responsibility of, um, he says, you know, socialist men, like any man who's not working first and foremost on killing the dominant male within himself is not a socialist and is not a revolutionary. I think that's um, really inspiring um, also yeah, just a really inspiring idea. Um, so this booklet, this pamphlet that we produced is a lot about that theory within the Kurdish freedom movement. Also kind of the background to it, also how it's worked in practice with educations, men's educations and mixed educations. We're also looking um, in the pamphlet at the work of Bell Hooks, coming from a very different context. Um, but it's really interesting that uh, she's also centering this idea of like changing masculinity and changing men. Um, and I find it really uh, kind of, really exciting that from such different contexts people with such different lives and such different political backgrounds and social backgrounds can still be we can be finding so many common points um, in their work I think it means we've really got to something um, so yeah it is a really important part of um, of what Ujlan has to say uh, and a lot of the stuff in the pamphlets sort of translated into English for the first time which is yeah also really exciting um, yeah, I don't think it's actually in the pamphlet, but uh, again, you can see Ujilan's relationship to the women's movement and to killing the dominant male. Certainly is the, it is mentioned in the pamphlet. He says, you know, every day I kill the man in me like 40 times. Like, this is a constant struggle. This is not saying like I'm done and I've sorted it and now everyone else has to sort themselves out. Um, and also uh, there's a quote of his that I really like. He says, you know, never trust a man, not even me. Um, much as like that trust is is very willingly given by so many women in the Kurdish women's movement. He's saying, no, don't do that. Um, you have to form, you have to organize autonomously. You have to build your own power. Like that's the most important thing. Um, and the kind of relationship that people in the movement have with Ujilan, um is like, yeah, it's something that you, you come to understand more and more over time. And I think it's not necessary that we all as internationalists develop that exact same relationship or that we try and like replicate these structures or like replicate this stuff. Um, but you start to understand like what exactly is so important about it. Um, you know, he is the, the leader of this movement and the leader for so many people, he, he is their leader. Um, and again, something else that he said that I think is, is actually really beautiful is, you know, he says, I'm not asking you to love me, I'm asking you to understand me. And he actually talks a lot about love and his theories on love are really incredible and really important. And love again is like this really important thing for socialism. Like I don't take this quote to mean to understand that he's not interested in, in love. I think he thinks that um, my understanding of a lot of his work is that like how we can better love each other is like really at the core of making a revolution. But what this quote means, you know, I don't want you to love me. I want you to understand me. It means like, I'm not looking for, worship i'm not looking to be the boss in like that kind of sense i'm looking for like these ideas that i've got that are synthesized from so many other things to make action in the world and so like yeah i think that's a really that's something else that i think is is really important um and just this idea of of synthesis uh Ojalan has described himself as like sort of someone who like reads a lot of things and I'm paraphrasing now, but kind of grabs and pulls different things together and pulls them 
together and makes sort of the cumulative next step with all these theories. I think you do see that in his theoretical and ideological work. He's very ready to credit everyone he's read um, and talk about how he thinks they all fit together and then kind of make more than just the sum of its parts with that. Um, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge, even though he's been uh, stuck in a position where the only way he can communicate with the world is through writing for a long time. This isn't just about theory. This is also about like lived experience. So uh, he's synthesized much more than just other theory that he's read. He's synthesized like the whole life that he's lived. Uh, and that includes like um, the relationships that he had with little girls when he was a little boy and how he started to see that things were really unfair. And that like triggered and started a lot of this, um, you know, anti-patriarchal stuff um, and everything that he lived uh, within the Turkish state and all these experiences in organizing. So like all that stuff kind of feeds into it, feeds into it as well. Um, and I just finally, I would wanna add that at the moment with everything that's going on with Corona, I sometimes just stop to think, like it feels so limited, right? It feels like we can't do any organizing um, or we can't get out and do stuff and things are just really frustrating. And whatever you think about the kind of legitimacy of the government's restrictions um, or the situation, the macro situation, like it is what it is. And a lot of things are just not possible right now. Um, and you feel quite limited. And I just find it really inspiring to stop and think, all right, so we're a bit limited because like we're not allowed to like have large gatherings of people but we're not nearly as limited as being in total isolation for nearly a decade in one of the most like enforced prison islands in the world and the really awful conditions. And somehow he's managed to find a way to like write <laughs> this broad scoping, universal, revolutionary, incredible ideology and get it out from there. And I sort of think, all right, we can probably do something with this isolation situation, like be reminded that, and be inspired by this. And be reminded that we can make this time as well. I think this there are so many things that I want to come back on in what you said. There's some stuff about like uh the way that he writes because he also like invites like also we had this discussion we have um in the UK we have a reading group for Ojalan's defense writings um which Raima joined us for the other day um and we're we're asking this question um about some difficult parts of his text and Raima's response to this was like really to to you know explain how much he invites criticism from other people as well and that it's not just um you know he's not just writing in this very static way he's writing in this way where like he thinks that other people should input in his ideology and people should pull him up where he goes wrong and I think this is really interesting to um like as you know like some of the quotes also that you you spoke about there they're very humble and like he's very willing to to admit when you know when he might be wrong or to say like criticize me yeah and I think this is something that's that's quite unique in many ways to the Kurdish freedom movement that there can be uh criticism without it feeling like a total destruction or uprooting or throw everything out and and start again it's like this you know take a step forward and then come back and, and check that the step that you did was right by evaluating it and things. And I think this is something very interesting that maybe you want to say a little bit about. Um, and also this foregrounding of love. Like, I think, you know, like when you can have critique and love, which are in, you know, from my very European perspective, when I went to, to Rojava, like, you know, these two things were two things at the opposite ends of the spectrum because critique is something you're supposed to be defensive about and scared of. And then love is something that, that everybody is trying to aim for and, you know, in whatever way, but to have those two things working together and like the base of the ideology in some way being, being both of those things is, is not as contradictory as it could seem to like many, many European people who are listening to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, and I think also just the conditions under which these kind of major books, um, that, you know, the defense writings that are sort of the best known and most in depth and, and some of the most recent were written, you know, it's very clear 
the he hasn't had access to resources for example so he's sort of saying himself quite often like you know you can only have so many books at a time he doesn't have like the internet um so of course like yeah of course you know he's saying very clearly this is under certain conditions that i've been able to do this and and always saying like to i guess yeah, the idea that an idea would be sort of finished and done and kind of dead in that way is just the antithesis to like everything that um, he promotes and and believes in. So this idea of always continuing discussion, um, I think, is really crucial and really, really important. And yeah, a lot of a lot of things like talking about love and beauty and truth and like, what are these things um, and the family and a lot of things that I guess are often dismissed in organizing circles in some areas um often particularly in like in my experience in the uk in europe in general as kind of fluffy not important and if you bring them up you know you'll be told um oh that's not a big deal or whatever even if it, you know like the women's issue maybe it's like yeah whatever like claire said it's this kind of nice add-on but also things like love and respect and how we talk to each other it's like that's not important what's important is like what we get done um and i just think it's really significant that this uh, this figure with like more experience in really getting a lot of stuff done than most of us are ever ever going to be able to aspire to and like this really kind of like hardcore life experience and some of the worst oppression that anyone has faced in recent years is still like more than ever foregrounding questions of love respect how human beings can and should interact with each other like that's really that's the core and that's the crux of it and i find that really yeah really really inspiring and really sort of grounding as well and claire also said you know you kind of know you're doing um or i guess it was saying that it's clear that the turkish state is afraid of Rojava and afraid of the experiment there and, and what it represents and i just wanted to expand on that a little bit more and say i think it's also clear that um, all of these international powers that were involved in the conspiracy on the 15th of February in 99 um, are afraid of Ujlan and like what his ideas represent. It's like he's he's come to represent much more than just an individual. Um, and yes, he represents that to people who love and respect him and are part of the Kurdish freedom movement. Um, but I think it's also very significant that he clearly represents much more than just an individual person to his enemies as well. Like his enemies know perfectly well what Ujalan stands for and what he represents and what he like, um, you know, they are not just isolating him, they're trying to isolate these ideas. Um, and it's obviously barbaric and awful, but at the same time, it is this sense of like, someone's doing something right, when like your enemy, enemies recognize the importance in this way, like it means that we are like pushing in the right place. Um, yeah, that's a really good thing to, to come back on. Um, so I guess we said we'd open the floor for some questions. Um, I can't actually see hands. Um, Pete, who is our tech wizard, wizard, maybe can. But if people want to ask questions, maybe they can put a little asterisk in the chat um, and uh, then they can ask questions to the speakers. Um, I know this is maybe going to scare you all. Potentially. But maybe, okay, maybe no one has any questions. Uh, uh, Sarah? Hi. Um, yeah, I was wondering if um, if there was we could learn a little bit more about what the situation is now and when last Oshla was actually able to get any texts out to us and how much is how much do we know how much is he able to do at the moment? Does someone want to come back on that? Rama, maybe. Yeah, I can. Um, well, right now, we basically do not know anything. We know he's uh, 
on the island together with three other prisoners. So there are four at the moment, but they're all in the same kind of isolation. So none of them can see their family. None of them can see their lawyers. None of them can make phone calls. None of them can send or receive letters. So they're like totally cut off from the world. That's, that's the current situation. So we assume that if something, you know, worse or, you know, even worse would, would happen, you know, we would know because, you know, people, word would come out. So we, we kind of think that the isolation is stable and uh, this horrible situation is just continuing as it was. But we can't be sure. Nobody, technically nobody knows anything. Um, the latest book that came out, like this long writing, this fifth volume of the, his manifesto, uh, of the democratic um, civilization or democratic society um, that was written or published in 2000. No, it was written earlier, but it was it, you know, well, 2011, let's say. So it's basically like 10 years that uh, no real text has come out. So everything that you're reading is actually even older. It's really shocking, isn't it? And I, I just wondered as well um, if you wanted to say anything about the, the hunger strike that's going on at the moment and the hunger strikes that have gone on in the past to try and, and change things and what you see, you know, what you see as the next stage of that, because that's really frightening too. Yes, there have been in the past uh, when, when this isolation, you know, became really unbearable, especially for the, for the Kurds who are following the situation very closely all the time. Uh, they went to the, uh, they, they turned towards hunger strikes and made hunger strikes. And it, uh, sometimes it started in, in the city, sometimes it started in the prisons. Right now, uh, you've probably all followed the, the, the big hunger strike that was started by Leila Güven when she was herself in, in prison, which then, you know, spread um and ultimately you know was able to uh, lift the isolation for a short moment at least uh and and right now it's again in the prisons there have been for more than two months now uh, rotating hunger strikes so different groups they uh you know do hunger strike for a while and then another group takes over uh so this is continuing uh this is not i mean this is um already it shows how alarmed people are many people are, are joining these hunger strikes um and it can of, of course mean that you know at, at some point some people go to more extreme uh measures and more extreme forms of hunger strike uh i mean the, the situation is 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 basically not changing which is in itself is a problem because you know we we don't want to get used to this kind of situation it's absolutely impossible unbearable it contradicts all kinds of whatever human rights standard legislations you name it uh, and it's a shame that we all together have not been able yet to uh, really bring any efficient you know actors into this to change uh, this situation and Rama, do you want to just while we're on the topic, say a few words about the situation of Leila Guvin now, because she's now again imprisoned by the Turkish state. Um, yes, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I can say anything uh, uh, on her current situation. I'm, I'm not really, uh, I don't really know. Maybe somebody else talk. does. Other people may have been following that more closely in recent weeks. I can't remember how long she's been in prison for, but it's, I think it's something like 20 years. I mean, what was noteworthy about this was the, uh, was the, the total ridiculousness of the, um, you know, of the, of the indictment that was, uh, you know, it, it's like the, the, the clause she was, uh, the, the, the article of the penal code was, uh, was the one on, on, you know, hate speech and inciting hatred and everything. And that was about a, a, a sentence that she said about the history of patriarchy, that patriarchy is a, you know, 5,000 year old system of uh, oppression. Uh, so this is like inciting hatred against men. So that's like, you know, a total, you know, made up ridiculous uh, pretext as if they need any pretext to, you know, imprison you know, oppositionals, but, um, I mean, Leila Guven is, of course, a very strong symbol for the 
uh, Kurdish self-organization in, in the cities uh, under extremely difficult conditions. She has been chairing uh, the Democratic Society Congress as a you know uh, umbrella organization for a lot of civil initiatives in the cities and uh, at the same time was very active as a you know parliamentarian and politician. So she's like very exposed in the eye of the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go back to the chat. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, feel free to put the asterisk in if you want to ask something. There is a question here from Leslie that says, uh, which book would you recommend to read first? <laughs> um, so maybe you can all say your favorites or like uh, things that brought you into the reading. Claire, maybe, do you want to go first? I think that the the shorter ones um, <laughs> gives up from my less academic point of view, um, but Rhymer put in the chat, earlier I'm just trying to scroll through it are um probably the better ones you know I don't know where people are academically but the better ones I found to start with is just to go on those very short ones that Reimer and his team produced because they have they have all all of that kind of inspirational stuff that will hook you into it wanting to read anything any further so personally I would go with those, those shorter texts Maribel? Yeah, for a first one, um, I particularly, there's a, a short pamphlet that's just called Democratic Confederalism, I think, and it's like laying out um, the his sort of proposal for a political system and it has all these different sections and it's quite, yeah, it's kind of frustratingly superficial, but it's a little bit of everything, only by, only by dint of length, not by length. <laughs> Um, it's because, it, you know, it's a nice, short, neat little thing that re yeah, really is quite easy to read. And it very much is, yeah, it's like a taster and you're like, oh, I have to read more of this now. Um, and then definitely the book that so far I've got the most out of is the Third Defence Writing Sociology of Freedom. Mm -hmm. But that is probably not one to start with because mm -hmm. um, not only is it much longer and more in depth and some people struggle with that, but it's I feel like it helps to have a little bit of context before you mm -hmm. jump into that one. Um, but yeah, the Democratic and Federalism pamphlet, I think is a really, really, really good place to start. Mm. Yeah, so these short pamphlets, uh, Raima, maybe you want to just like pick them up a little bit. Cause yes, I mean, this Democratic Confederalism has, has proved uh, extremely popular. It's, it has been by far the most read and most uh, translated, you know, text. Uh, it, it, translations of it and, and even publications pop up in countries that we would never have expected it so it has been published all over the world and, and retranslated uh, I'm, I'm shocked to hear that it's uh, shockingly superficial uh, we put a lot of effort into it but uh, <laughs> it's you know what what this compilation and, and this one and also the other ones they are compilations so they draw from all of the five volumes even from volume four and five there's a lot especially democratic nation is a lot from volume five uh, that hasn't been translated yet, so we you know, thought we'd bring some of the important stuff out in an easily readable form. The, 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 my, my favorite and many people's favorite who have written a lot of veterans books is actually the Beyond State Power and Violence, which is about to come out in English, it has been out in, in German for a while. So it's going to be published. I'm also, I mean, if, if I say, tell people if you want to read only one book by Ödeland, then this is the one to go to. I'm not really sure if you, you know, for introduction, whether it would be the best one. It's not out anyway yet, but um, yeah, that's what I can say. Um, now, Raima, I said tantalizingly, as in you want to go deeper when you've read it. So <laughs> nowhere criticism of the pamphlet. Um, okay, there's a question from Paul. Do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you. So I had a very quick question uh, for you. Um, it's about the third volume of Sakini Chansi's autobiography. Does anyone know when that might be translated? Well, we're talking about the question of uh, translated works. It, it is translated. I'm not really sure about the publication status of, of uh, all of them, but uh... Largely, I mean, volume one and two are definitely translated, but I'm not really sure about. 
I think the first because one must, must be published, in, isn't it? The first it, one is out in English, isn't it? No, no, the first two are out in English. All okay. three exist in German. Janet Beale was see. doing the translations, but I haven't seen the third one available in English yet. It's so not the yet. Question is, that's, that's do we true. have a do we have a, a timeline on that? Does anyone know about that? Not right now, sorry. But it's in the works. I know that. They're uh, very easy to read Sakina Jansen's books. Um, there's a question from Evie, which I guess, uh, I guess, Veraban, you're very well placed to answer this, uh, which is, I was wondering about learning Kurdish or Kamanji language. What are your experiences with this? Um, I'm sure actually all three of you might be able to comment. I don't know uh, how your Kamanji is, Claire, but. Uh, uh, my Comanji is both good and not French, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't. <laughs> um, but maybe Barry, because you're, you know, like we were in Russia together, and your your language skills are quite impeccable and came very quickly. So uh, maybe you'd like to talk a bit about this. Um, I mean, I think they're definitely pretty impeccable. Um, but yeah uh i guess what's interesting like there are lots of there mm, no there are some good resources for learning Comanche, not as many as it would be nice um and people are working on producing more um i guess it's also a really political point around like the kurdish freedom movement all the different kurdish dialects and kurdish languages um have in different ways been like banned and suppressed uh people have not been allowed to speak or write in their own language um many people from Kurdistan um, come to learning, have to come to learning Kurdish later due to like state oppression. So like learning um, that language, um, especially for kind of political engagement can be quite a, you know, it, it's it's a politically, um, uh, it, it's a political act, it has a political edge. It's um, obviously important for communication, um, but it's also a really kind of significant thing. And we actually had a really beautiful moment in Rojava, um, when uh, Arin was also there and Arin and I and um, several other internationalists connected with the movement um, were sitting around talking in Kermanji Kurdish and someone sort of stopped and pointed out at one point that for none of us was Kermanji our first language but it was the lingua franca that we all understood there was no other language that all of us understood not everyone spoke English not everyone spoke Turkish not everyone spoke German um, and someone just said wow that's really powerful that you know they tried so hard to wipe out this language and today it was the lingua franca it's the language that it's not anyone's first one but we all have to speak it to each other um so there are these yeah kind of moments as well um uh just yeah in terms of practicalities there's stuff online um and there's usually anywhere near um the any sort of the different kurdish movements or kurdish afterwards there's always people willing to teach as well um so yeah and then it's and then it's like learning any language i guess um, that that's really a problem for us you know that you guys are all learning kurdish now because somebody also has to learn turkish to help us with the translation <laughs> um, but the short answer is how to learn kumanji is go to kurdistan there's no other way you can't learn it in the uk or anywhere else in europe yeah i found that and me and Rama were again having this conversation a bit yesterday um that it's really hard to learn the grammar in Kurdish because everybody like in Kamanji because it's not like a very standardized grammar and everybody speaks a little bit different so if you look at Rojava I mean Rojava is not like a huge place you know it's about the size of Wales but Kabani Kamanji is really really different to the Kamanji that's spoken in in Derek or in Jazeera region and Afrin like just if you learn your Kurdish in Jazeera, forget about it. Like it's really, really, really difficult to um, go between the two. So it's really, really right. With the best way is to go to Kurdistan because then you you just learn from the people how they speak, and, and mostly people try to understand you. Is my experience. Um, so we have five minutes left, and maybe we can just do some closing closing wind up. I know Claire's got her hand up. So um, I was I'll ask if I can ask a question, but I don't know if that's protocol. Yeah, right. shoot. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask something of um, Berivan actually of her experience while she was in Rojava. 
Um, so, you know, I was, how I was saying, you know, you know, it's clearly not been a magic wand that's, you know, changed overnight into this great society of equality and stuff. Um, but, you know, when I went there, obviously I went to like, you know, where they took me to because I wasn't there as part of the international group. I was there as the delegate. I took the MPs and stuff. Um, so I obviously saw it all and it was amazing, but it was in the sort of the city and I missed it and stuff like that. Um, I w what I really would like to know is like how um, the women's movement there uh, gets on outside of those of the villages and within the tribes and like the Arab tribes and stuff and how the, that they react um, to Erdogan's writings, which aren't part of their culture and stuff beforehand. Um, and how that persuasion happens. You know, I, I, I know that, you know, obviously it, Arab women are being particularly targeted at the moment for being part of this revolution, um, which is really, really concerning. Um, and, but it's just, I, I'd, I'd just be interested in knowing how you, how you win over those very, very, very patriarchal cultures that exist there. Thanks, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, so I guess it's just um, obviously it's incredibly complicated. Like this is it, right? Like this is the question about social change and how we make a difference and how we make a revolution. So there's no short answer. Um, but like what I saw and I spent like a long time with um, the women's movement in a couple of different capacities. And it's interesting that you bring up this example of, of like uh, Arabic tribes and so on, because the there are organizations like the Syrian Women's Council, which is the uh, autonomous women's structure of the Syrian Democratic Council, which is the kind of political, um, kind of political engagement party structure um, uh, within like the uh, autonomous area of northern East Syria. Um, and there were they're like really Syrian Women's Council actually have a wider spread and more connections than the Syrian Democratic Council in a lot of parts of North and East Syria. And they are the answer to how they're doing this work is slowly and with, you know, just every single step that it takes, like all this really unglamorous day to day sitting around talking, building connection finding a commonality no matter how small and then building from that and seeing where you get to you know coming into meetings with like the wives of the significant Arabic tribal leaders um, in whatever area and being willing to like meet people on their terms in their spaces and talk to them and not patronize them and not say you're here to save them and like engage in these ways and like it's incredibly uh kind of you know it's not this image of like someone rushing about with a gun that we have of these women revolutionaries but like it's incredible work and the the women who recently were kidnapped and lost their lives for this um i actually met them both just briefly but i did meet them while i was in russia and they that's this is exactly what they were doing um they are like slowly at a pace that can bring everyone with us like moving this conversation forward and starting to shift the possibilities uh, it's incredibly slow, frustrating, complicated, contradictory, murky, dirty, like incredible work. And it's like what it's all about to me. And again, you know, they've just um, these two women friends uh, recently lost their lives and ISIS um, claimed the assassination. Um, it was definitely targeted. It was definitely for their political involvement. Um, and significantly also during the Sarikania invasion, the politician Hevrin Khalaf. Uh, who's a member of the Future Syria Party. Um, she was the, the chair of the Future Syria Party, um, was targeted and assassinated, you know, definitely by jihadist groups specifically sponsored by Turkey, and she was personally targeted and assassinated. And what for? For being a woman in politics who was building bridges, who was moving things forward with diplomacy and dialogue. This is what she was famous for, for being able to get people you'd never think you could get around the table talking um, and doing that like in a different way, doing that as a woman and not being willing to like give in and play the patriarchal game. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, it's about uh, your enemies know how important that is. And that's why these people are targeted. Um, and I think it is also, again, really, really in the spirit of Ujjalan, like, um, you know, he was willing to say there has to be a diplomatic solution. He was willing to say, you know, at moments, um, 
to stop the like a military engagement um, much, much quicker than the Turkish state was ever willing to do any such thing and to engage in diplomacy um, and to do things the long, slow way that make actual change. So like, again, I think these things are like really connected. It's like day-to-day -day practice and the ideology. Um, you can really see the ways that they're connected to each other. Uh, stop you there, Barry, because that's a perfect place to stop. And thank you for bringing all of these like amazing women into this dialogue. Like, I think it's really important that we recognize them and we put their names in this space. And there's this like very uh, beautiful phrase that Angela Davis like puts in one of her books where she's talking um, from the perspective of like reading the posters of the Colored Women's Associations in the 60s. And this phrase is like all over the posters, which is lift as we climb, which is like, you know, this this thing that you were just talking about, like about how important it is that we take everybody with us in the revolution. And it's not just about like getting ahead as revolutionaries. And I think that's a really nice place to like bring this discussion to an end. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's been an amazing uh, discussion and really nice to uh, to see so many people here um, and uh, yeah I guess we can uh, say thank you to all of the speakers thank you to Rema thank you to Claire thank you to Beravan um, and just to plug an event quickly at you all um, there's the second part of these this seminar series I guess it's kind of a series that's going to happen on Friday which is called From Arrest to Abolition um, I think Pete can just flash up the thing now um, which is going to be another event uh, that's related to the Long March, um, where we start, where we talk to Abdullah Ojalan's lawyers um, and hear about his situation at the moment, um, but also to talk to some friends who are struggling in the UK prison system, um, or like who have been struggling in the UK prison system in the UK, and to like bring bring this topic of abolition um, all together. So uh, yeah, um, I don't know if Roma and Claire, you have anything else that you guys want to plug just really quickly and then we'll just finish. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody who helped organize this for the moderation and everybody who, who joined us, who was uh, willing to listen and interested and ask questions and answered them. Thank you all very much. Um, yeah, um, just echo Rama's uh, comments. Um, thanks ever so much for organizing it. And if any of you in the UK and are part of a trade union movement, please look us up um, because it's important to get more important people on board uh, with the campaign to free Edgelan. Thanks. Very good. I would just echo you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here and listening all the questions. Um, thank you, Irene, for uh, doing so much organizing and for um, presenting and yeah uh, really really great to hear everyone and be here cool uh, well with that we will say Sikiftin and good night uh, maybe all of us who are speaking can do a quick evaluate -y.